I remember we passed the white school on 231. At the time, I didn't really understand why Daddy wasn't stopping there. I guess it was explained to me that there were white schools and there were black schools. And we just went to the schools that were designated for us. What education meant for African Americans in the late 19th century and the early 20th century was basically everything. You have almost four million African Americans, formerly enslaved people, who are now getting this new birth of freedom. And then within two generations, you have the end of Reconstruction, and you've got a settling in of very oppressive politics, the disfranchisement of African Americans socially, economically, politically, a rise in racial violence, and then you've also got separate but equal policies being the law of the land regarding education. And especially in the South, African Americans were not given due access to public education. And especially in some of the rural areas, education was very tentative. Essentially, you still had um, a population in the South that wanted African Americans essentially to be a workforce, a labor force, an industrial force, and not an educated force because education is the key to unlocking your portion of democracy. I began Scrabble School in 1953, started in the first grade, and I completed grades one through seven. My father, Clyde Carpenter, most people know him by his middle name, Ashby Carpenter, was a Rappahannock County bus driver. So the big yellow bus was a familiar sight in our driveway. I had two elementary school teachers, Mrs. Austin in that room and Miss Williams in this one. <laughs> the Rosenwald schools, when they were developed, provided some of the first permanent educational facilities for people in these rural communities in 15 southern states. And so that made the difference. The amazing partnership that uh, happened between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington really began when Julius Rosenwald read Up From Slavery, which was Booker T. Washington's autobiography. He sought out Booker T. Washington and he actually joined the board of Tuskegee. And as a result, Booker T. Washington, seeing an opportunity, then, then asked Julius Rosenwald if he would help with this scheme that he had to promote African-American education throughout the South. And they began the process of having Julius Rosenwald partially finance the construction of schools for African-Americans. And between 1913 and 1932, that partnership helped to produce the construction of over 5,300 schools for African-Americans in a segregated South. Our parents bought our books each year. We were taught to take care of the books, to respect our property, to respect our school. That um, metal thing right there on, in the floor signifies where the coal stove was. In the morning, when Daddy let the first load of children off, the older boys in the group were responsible for getting the fire started in each stove in the classroom. Generally speaking, the Rosenwald model was for him to provide about a third of the money required to construct a school. And then it would be up to the state and the local African Americans to produce the rest of the money. And in doing that, he empowered them to really invest in their time, their resources, in the construction of these schools, the maintenance of these schools, and then making sure that their children attended these schools and benefited from them. The financial contributions of the African American community, in some senses, it was a, an unfair second burden. They were tax-paying citizens. They should have been able to access public education. Soup Day usually began 
I want to say in January, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, whoever wanted to contribute a pot of soup. And we loved it. And, and the doors would, would be opened. So it was like you were having a restaurant moment, but you were at school. Many of the students who were in Rosenwald schools in the 1950s, the late 1950s, then were merged into white schools after desegregation. The Rosenwald schools then became Head Start centers, community centers, and some of them slowly began to disappear from the landscape. And so we have only a small percentage of Julius Rosenwald schools left uh, throughout those 14, 15 southern states. That's why the rush is on right now to protect and preserve them and create this new park for Julius Rosenwald so that we can attach that legacy to a national park system. To get a national park, in almost all of the cases, you need legislation. And so it happened. On December 17th, the House bill was passed by 387 to 5. The House bill was passed in the Senate by unanimous consent. And one of the eight original co-sponsors in the House was Congressman Lewis, John Lewis. And John Lewis went to a Rosenwald School in Alabama. If you get a special resource study bill passed, that only directs uh, the National Park Service to do the study. It does not create the park, but it's a key step toward creation of a park. I don't recall seeing the name of Julius Rosenwald in any of the history books I used. And the more I read now, the more I realize how much was left out of the history that was being taught. It's like constantly putting the pieces of a puzzle together. I think my time at Scrabble did influence my choice of profession to become a teacher. My experience helped me to get a generation, the generation behind me to fully understand the impact of separate but equal, or the concept that was supposed to be equal. What I went through took it from the pages of the book to real life. And, and maybe, just maybe, somewhere along the way, I help them understand the responsibilities of all citizens. I think what the Rosenwald School symbolized in the time that they were built was hope. And these people who were graduating from Rosenwald Schools in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, they became that solid, expanded African-American middle class that in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s really helped to support the Civil Rights Movement. The opportunity to establish a park that would honor the life and legacy of a man who was motivated by his faith and the concept of sadaka, that people needed to be treated in a humanitarian way and in a righteous way. This is a story for our time. And we are seeing so much angst and so much hatred in our discourse. It is about education, but it educates the public and it provides us with an opportunity for reflection and for healing. It will be the first park that will be uh, tell the story of a Jewish American. Not only his story as a Jewish American, but how he and African Americans work together to help the entire nation. I think that Scrabble School holds a place in history that can't be replaced by something artificial. If this building had been knocked down and some kind of stone monument left in its place. The real significance of this Rosenwald School would never have been grasped. And unless there is something tangible that you can come into, 
and look at and read about, it makes it real. Had there not been philanthropists like Julius Rosenwald, who knows what would have happened? What would we have to show?